why you should apply for one of these, and I think my answer is going to be counterintuitive. We'll see where I'm going with that in just a sec. Then I want you to understand what the DDIG program is and how proposals are reviewed, because unless you understand that, you might be shooting in the wrong direction. You might have an awfully good proposal, but if it doesn't meet what NSF wants or what the reviewers expect, you're not going to be successful. So you kind of have to put yourself in the mind frame of NSF and reviewers. So I want to tell you about that. And then finally, I'll give you a, a brief overview, just some tips about what a good proposal looks like. And then Brett will fill in with specific examples of his proposal. All right? So that's where we're going. Um, why to apply? Well, first of all, um, this program, unlike most other NSF programs, has a pretty good success rate, okay? About 20 to 30 percent, depending upon the year, depending upon the particular division, somewhere in that ballpark get funded. Um, that's a lot. That's two to three times a better percentage success rate than most, quote unquote, regular NSF programs. So although those numbers may not seem very high to you, um, if you're going to be successful in NSF, and you need to be successful in NSF, I'll get to that in just a sec, this is a good place to start. Um, NSF is, at least in my line of work, um, is the gold standard for how rigorous your science is, and it's a very good barometer of how successful, in quotes, I guess, uh, you'll be in the future. If you can land an NSF grant as a graduate student, that will open doors for you. It'll look great on your CV, and people that are look, considering you for a job are much, much more likely to take you seriously. It's a really important credential to have. It's worth putting a lot of time and effort into trying to get one of these. Um, a lot of graduate students and professors uh, make a common mistake, and that is they think that hard work can substitute for hard thought. And they think as long as somebody is working hard on their dissertation, that's what we want. Well, you know what? A lot of people don't think hard enough about what they do before they do it. And then after they do it, they say, I wish I had done it this way. Writing a proposal, especially a short, pithy one, these are eight pages long, writing a proposal like this forces you to think hard about just what it is that you want to get done. And if you don't, at least if you're like me, if you don't force yourself to take the opportunity to do that, you'll kind of live in your comfort zone of getting stuff done day to day, and you'll never really take the opportunity to really sharpen that focus or your questions until maybe you're in your defense, or your qualifying exam, and somebody on the opposite side of the table says, well, what about this? And then that's a good offer. Um, another reason to do this is that you're guaranteed feedback. Um, you may not like the feedback, but trust me, it'll be healthy. Um, every proposal that's submitted to NSF gets a very standardized set of reviews on two criteria, what are called scientific merit and broader impacts. We can talk about those, and I think Brett's going to talk about those in a bit. But it, th this, sounds, this sounds weird, but you almost have to fail in order to succeed in this game of grantsmanship. Um, everybody who's ever gotten a grant, I guarantee you, has been unsuccessful more times than they've been successful. It's hard. It does not come naturally. The only way to really get better at it is to get feedback and then to practice. The best predictor of success in grantsmanship, not just NSF, but any grant, the best predictor of success is how many times you submit something. All right? You've got to get started now. Um, now, you'll notice all those reasons I didn't once mention money. And I think that most of you, the reason why you're interested in a dig is because of the money it provides. And let me tell you, from, from my perspective, the amount of money that these digs provide is, is, is not a huge amount. Now, don't get me wrong. Money is important. 10 to 15,000 is nothing to sneeze at. But trust me, in the long run, this kind of stuff is a whole lot more important to professional development than the money that's going to come with this. All right? Easy for me to say, but it's true. All right. Let me tell you about the process. Don't look at your papers in front of you. How many people know what DIG stands for? Raise your hand. You can just rattle it off. 
Okay, maybe a fourth of you. You need to know. What it stands for is Doctoral Dissertation Improvement Grant. That word is really important if you want to get yourself into the mindset of NSF. You need to, when you write this proposal, um, convince the reviewers and convince NSF that you are improving your dissertation. You've already got your dissertation figured out. It's already been approved by your committee. You've passed your qualifying exams. You're almost there, but there's this one missing piece that you just got to have, and you're excited about it. And that's what this program is aimed to help you have. All right? You can't write one of these gigs by saying, this is my dissertation, and this is what I'm going to do. You've got to say, this is the dissertation that I already have pretty much under my belt, and this is the final step. So if you'll just give me that one final piece, we'll be all set. That's the mindset, okay? In terms of the process, who is successful and who is not is determined by not so much the NSF program officers, but by the reviewers. They sit around in a room like this, around a table, and they rank your proposals. If they rank your proposal high, almost guaranteed, almost, NSF will fund it. You have to write to the reviewers. You've got to put yourself in the head of the reviewers, and you've got to keep in mind that they're human. They've got a stack, an electronic stack, as it turns out, of these proposals to read one after another after another after another after another for days on end. And so it gets kind of boring, all right? You need to make your proposal easy to understand, easy to follow, and exciting. If it's a plain vanilla proposal, no matter how good it is technically, um, it's not going to stand out. And these reviewers are just, you know, they, 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 may, they may give you a, a good mark on it. But if, if you want to really stack things in your favor, you've got to write in a way that is appealing to them. Don't make it stodgy science, okay? You're not writing a manuscript where conciseness is important. The goal here is to communicate and to show enthusiasm, all right? It's a different kind of writing style. And we've got examples of those writing styles. So I'll give you some at the end of this. And, and as Beth said, these are posted also. Um, your reviewers are going to be generalists. Um, if you're an ecologist, I'm an ecologist, it's safe to say the reviewer will be an ecologist. But they won't be, in my case, somebody that studies seed dispersal by birds. All right? And if I write that proposal, assuming that that reviewer knows something about seed dispersal by birds, I'm going to be making a big mistake. I'm going to be irritating them. Okay? <laughs> so you want to write these proposals in such a way that pretty much anybody in your general field can understand. Don't worry about sounding too simplistic at, in the introduction. It's a bigger mistake to jump right into a whole bunch of detail that will bore or go over the head of the reviewers. Um, whether they deserve to be or not, um, reviewers are perfectionists, um, which is unfair because they make mistakes too, of course. But the hard truth is that they are looking for reasons to knock down proposals a little bit. And if your proposal has typos in it, or if it doesn't follow the format that Beth has given you, laid out, um, they are going to consciously or subconsciously take you down a notch or two. And it's going to color everything that they read from there on out in your proposal. Um, and you don't want that, all right? So if there's one time in your life to be perfect, it's when you write an NSF proposal. And you need to have other people look at it and look for any sort of, of errors. As I said, these proposals are judged on two criteria, scientific merit, what NSF calls scientific merit, and what they call broader impacts. The scientific merit is just like what it sounds like. Um, how good is the science? Is it worthwhile or is it boring? Um, Broader impacts are a whole lot trickier, and it really depends a lot upon your particular field and uh, the, the lab you're in. Um, it, it's very broad, as you know, the name implies. Basically, what NSF does not want is 
really good scientists who do nothing else but science. Okay? They want scientists and engineers, for that matter, to step outside, say, the university context and communicate what they do to the general public or to go into schools or to mentor Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts or to be uh, neighborhood leaders of some kind in the role of a scientist. Okay, that's what broader impacts is about. There are a lot of ways that you can that you can hit that. You cannot ignore it, and you cannot write it off. You will not get funded. This is the number one reason why proposals get knocked down. Is not because of bad science, but because people blew off broader impacts when they were writing their proposal. You need to seek advice from your advisor or other people in your particular subdiscipline. We can talk about it uh, later if you'd like as well. Okay, what the proposal should look like. These are general tips. Um, as I said before, it's got to be perfect. Um, I'm not kidding. Um, it's got to be convincing in terms of the science. Um, there are different ways to do this. The formula that I go for looks something like this. You need some sort of big important question that you lead with. It's got to be in the beginning of the first paragraph somewhere. And it's got to have recent references, okay? I, I, as a reviewer, if it's a big question from 1963 and you don't cite anything more recent, I'm going to think that's already settled and you're lazy for not finding more recent references, okay? I want to see recent references to show me that it's not only an important idea, but it's a hot idea as well. <clears throat> then you want to say, there's this missing piece there. You know, there's, there's this one dimension that people really haven't looked at. Um, everybody's looking over here, but this is really important. Um, and then you want to say, it's important because of this. This is how it fits in. And then what do you know? Here you write the rescue. This is what I'm going to provide. You know, I'm going to fill in that piece. And the goal here is that by the end of the introduction, this is where you spin things, by the end of that introduction, you need to have that reviewer thinking like this. Okay? Why do you really think of that? You know, why hasn't anybody done this before? This is so obvious. All right? That's what you want to shoot for. All right? That's the way to make things convincing. There are other ways to do it too, okay? This is not a one-size-fits-all. Um, you also have to have explicit hypotheses, or if you don't want to have hypotheses, they've got to be goals. And by explicit, I mean that they have to be very carefully worded and they have to be very obvious, okay? No matter how good your idea or your techniques, if you can't crystallize it, if you can't put it in a pithy statement as a hypothesis or a goal, reviewers are going to lose patience with you. They won't be able to see the forest through the trees. You've got to come right out and say, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to test. Um, you have to make that proposal look visually appealing. There are different ways to do this. Um, I recommend using different fonts, bold things, highlight things. Put in figures and pictures. Keep in mind that this is a dissertation improvement plan, right? So you should already have data. You can call it preliminary data if you want. There's nothing wrong with it. This is not publishing something, all right? But if you can show some data um, that will show the feasibility or that you've, you've invested something in this process, that is going to convince reviewers that this is indeed a dissertation improvement grant and that you know what you're talking about. And you have to have passed your qualifying exams before you can submit one of these proposals. So that by definition means you're a pretty senior graduate student and boy, you should be able to step up with some data. Um, again, <clears throat> take broader impacts very seriously. You do not, a lot of people just don't understand this. They say, I am going to go and talk to school kids about what I do. And, and, and they say, and this is important because I was a school kid once myself, and, and I like kids, and, and they're exciting, and you know, it's important that we do this. And they'll go on for a paragraph or two like that. That's the kiss of death, okay? What you want to do is be very explicit. I have talked to Sarah Charbonnet at Westwood Middle School. She teaches this class at this age level. She is interested in my project because of this. I am going, she has agreed to host me to come in 
and talk to her students about this topic, and I'm excited about doing that. And if you can show a track record, oh, by the way, I've done that before, then it'll be even more believable. Okay? So you need to be really specific about these broader impacts. Okay, last bit. Um, this is an example of Jill Jankowski's project summary. That's why it doesn't have references in it. But I wanted to take you kind of step by step through how you frame a question. Are we okay? Yes. Okay. So, so note, first of all, that this states that ecologists have this big question, and they've had it for a long time, about what maintains species ranges. Okay, that's the big question there. And then she says, if there's one system that's good for studying that, it's montane systems. In other words, elevational gradients. Because along elevational gradients, you can see often abrupt changes. You can see communities changing. And then, what do you know? Tropical montane regions are incredibly good. You know, they're, they're an unprecedented opportunity to study this. All right, so we've gone from a big question to a general approach to an opportunity that's essentially too good to pass up. All right, and most reviewers, when they see that, will feel as though um, you know what we're talking about. I was just curious, does the original proposal have the bolding and the underline? No, the no, that's your Um You can put it in there. Um, okay, and then this is the last slide with respect to broader impacts. I'm not going to show you her section on broader impacts because it's a page long. Instead, what I want to do is show you the panel summary. So after everybody has discussed this proposal, then one of the person, people on that panel will sit down and summarize everything that the panel said. And this is the type of thing that you want reviewers to be thinking and writing when they read your broader impacts. I'm not going to read it to you. Can you read it in the back? Can you read that? Go ahead. It's worth it. No, no, no. I didn't mean <laughs> Read it to yourself. Okay, so you can get a sense for what she said, right? And this is what you want reviewers to write, and especially this. Okay? I'm done. I'm going to turn it over to Brett, and then I think we'll open up the questions.